Okay, uh, next we are going to learn about plasticulture, fertigation, irrigation of tomatoes, and uh, that will go to about 12.15, and then we'll have lunch. So, Joe? Awesome. All right, thank you. So, oh, get the slides up here. All right. How many use plastic mulch or know what it looks like, at least? So... I think some of this might be a rehash for some of you, but I think it's always a good idea to look back and sort of reevaluate ourselves and is there any way that I can tweak my operation to do things a little bit different or a little bit better? Um, but generally speaking, I'm going to show you some nice pictures. I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of the general aspects of plastic culture. Uh, but, and then later this afternoon, I'm going to talk about sort of the specifics of irrigation scheduling and, and fertigation, injecting fertilizer through the system. So, but. Plasticulture is a method of production, uh, and it's using uh, raised beds with plastic mulch, and under the plastic mulch, we have something called drip irrigation installed, drip irrigation tape underneath those. And it's important that you have all these same elements in the system. You can use raised beds with drip tape with no plastic, but you have to have drip tape under plastic. That's a must. So otherwise, we can't figure, there's no other good way to get water under the plastic and into the plastic. I can't uh, advance. Oh, there we go. All right, advantages of plastic. So obviously with the fresh market, the big key in the fresh market is almost always earliness. That's why we use plastic. That's why we plant early. That's why we use transplants. So transplants already give us a, tr a jump on the market by using plastic culture so we can get anywhere from a seven to three week uh, jump on market. So with enhanced growth, just because of the, the way the plastics work. Higher yield per acre, and I'll show you some numbers of what that actually looks like, real, real world numbers. Uh, cleaner and higher quality produce. I'll also show you some pictures of that. It's also much more efficient use to water. Uh, when it comes down to it, you, end up, you don't end up wetting the row middles. Uh, you actually put the water exactly where you need it to be and depending on the surveys you look at and the research is done, you could be using anywhere from 15 to 25 percent of the water that a standard overhead system would use on that same on that same acreage. So it can be a real big savings for you, in ter especially in terms of water. Also, it seems like a small thing, but you could work in the field when your drip irrigation is on. Um, I know in the southeast where we have a lot of labor issues, anything we do to maximize our labor and labor efforts in the field is, is certainly helpful. You know, if we irrigate once a week with overhead, we have to wait for the field to dry out before we can actually get out there. So, so that's another one of the big advantages of, of plastic. Earlier production. Um, I've been at Auburn almost 28 years now. One of the first things I did was demos uh, where I would show what it was like with plastic, without plastic. And that's what this, these are some of these pictures I'm showing you. So, and these are just watermelons. This is a crimson sweet watermelon. We planted them on the same day. Actually, in this case, we put in transplants. They're both, they all got the same fertility. Everything's the same except one's on plastic with drip. The other one's not. It's just with drip. So the plant on the top portion of the field is already having, already has male or female flowers forming on it. So, so this is almost a two to 10 day jump um, on the plant. So it's a real number and it's real visible. Another, uh, another picture here, summer squash. Same kind of thing, so raised beds. So the, the summer squash actually, in this case, is actually on a biodegradable plastic. This was an older product. It's not available anymore, but it was just sort of doing a side-by-side -side kind of comparison. So in this case, the, the plastic broke down within two weeks of putting it out, so it didn't last very long. It wasn't, wasn't, that's why it's not on the market anymore. But um, the plastic here is already covered by the crop, you know, and we already have female blossoms forming on there, so in fruit forming. So, so it's a real big, obviously, this is a pretty dramatic difference, but it's a real difference that you actually see out in the field. Higher yields per acre, cleaner, higher quality produce. These are this is actually in Sand Mountain, Alabama. It's on the north, outside just north of Birmingham, where we still have about uh, uh, just probably about 2,500 acres of tomatoes still in that area. So and that's where this is at. They use a, a wider bed than normal. So, but what they found is it just keeps their crop cleaner. So instead of water splashing down on the soil and then splashing up into the plant, um, you know, it keeps the produce a lot cleaner. And in, th in their case. Uh, a lot of our growers field pack, they actually don't go into a packing house, so it really helps that, helps that facility, so helps facilitate that, rather. All right, cleaner, other uh, good picture. 
a similar grower, actually weeding with, with a wide bed, so with uh, melons, uh, small melons, these are cantaloupes, Athena cantaloupes. So we have a lot of problems with southern blight. You have it here too, but in Alabama, Mississippi, it is just problematic every year. So it's usually considered a wet weather disease, but it's been dry the last couple of summers, and it's still been a major problem. So when methyl bromide went away for a lot of growers, it used to help manage methyl bromide really well. That's not an option anymore. So there are some areas that it's gotten so bad in Alabama that we really can't grow there anymore without really significant rotations or go to a non-host crop like sweet corn or something like that. But these wide beds really help a lot. Anything, because any plant part that touches the soil can get southern blight. That's, that's the issue you run into. So, so obviously anything you can do to support the crop, get it up off the ground, it's gonna help with yields. The North Carolina Department of Agriculture has been doing, since the, the plasticulture really came into its, in the United States, really came into its own in the early 70s. So late 60s, early 70s, plastic materials became a lot more widely used, a uh, lot more research went into it. So, so through the 70s and 80s, so and really in the mid 80s, it really started coming in its, in its own. So, and the Department of Ag over in North Carolina started tracking what were the yields like for their traditional vegetable growers that grow on bare ground, with irrigation compared to plasticulture. So this is uh, just a snapshot of one of their study, and they're still doing this study. It's been going on since, I think, 78 or 79, so, so they've got 40-some years worth of data, but this is just a 10-year snippet that I'm looking at here. What they found was real-life differences. Eastern cantaloupes, they got four times the state yield. Uh, cucumbers, bell pepper, summer squash, tomato. Everything was either three or four times greater in terms of the yields and the quality. That also increases the fertil your fertilizer needs. So a lot of the fertilizer needs have been reworked in most of the states to accommodate plastic culture. We put out more plastic, we put out more fertilizer because the plants get larger and we have higher yields. So um, just to sort of one of those things. So you don't want to you don't necessarily want to rely on a bare ground recommendation for fertilizer because you may not be getting all the yields you could potentially get using plastic. The other thing this has done for people is this helps us take out land for rotation. You know, if I can get two or three times at least the yield that I typically would have gotten on this acre, you know, or it took me 10 acres to grow that, I can reduce it to five acres. So, and that's helped in the rotation planning, you know, for a lot of farms. Or it's also helped some of our farmers to simply become more diversified, grow other crops that they hadn't thought about growing. Uh, Right now, plastic culture is really suited to high-value crops. So when I say high-value crops, tomatoes, peppers, squashes, melons, cukes, eggplant, okra are probably the most common ones, especially where I'm at in the southeast. So, however, um, other crops like sweet corn, beans, snap beans, uh, peas, uh, pumpkins, they actually do quite well on it. The problem is always the margins. So if I'm wholesaling one of these crops, I'm probably not going to use plastic. Um, I'm going to talk about double cropping where you actually follow one crop with another crop on the plastic so you're reusing everything that's out there. Um, we have a lot of growers who will grow a uh, crop like strawberries in the summertime, you know, through, and they're done usually by June or so, and then what we'll do is they'll let it rest for a little while or they'll put a short season crop like squash. Then they'll come through and they'll put pumpkins on the old plastic, and that's a really good use of it. So, But if you're retailing plastic or retailing pumpkins, um, the economics tend to work a lot better in your favor. So wholesale is, like I said, with these other crops tends to be a little bit iffy. I'll show you some pictures of sweet corn that's done for really early production that's pretty cool. And it's, it's a very specific type of system, so where you can get a real high dollar value of, of sweet, co uh, sweet corn in the early season. With plastic, we have reduced soil and wind erosion, fewer weed problems, because you have a mulch layer on top of the surface. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that there's, you know, don't use any kind of mulch. Honestly, any kind of mulch is beneficial, organic or plastic otherwise. Anything you could do to protect that soil surface you're going to trap nutrients. You're going to hold water in there. You're going to also uh, hopefully discourage weed growth because, you know, anytime you've got sunlight hitting the soil, there's weed seeds are endemic on our environment. You know, anytime the wind blows, it blows wind seeds around. So this helps a great deal with weed control. Um, there are uh, herbicides that can be used underneath the plastic. They can actually be added to the beds beforehand. There's also fumigants that can be used. It really depends on your operation, you know, what you can use. And, but there are some tools that are available for some crops. All right, uh, I've already mentioned about potential in de uh, decrease in disease incidence. This is, this is uh, southern blight on cantaloupes. It's a real problem in Alabama on cantaloupes, watermelons. Basically, any plant part that touches the soil can get this. It's worse if it's more moist. So do you, has anybody ever seen this in their farms? So yeah, it's not, as a it's not as a common issue I've seen, at least from what I've read in 
um, you know, in Missouri. So, but in Alabama, and Mississippi, Georgia, uh, this in Panhandle, of Florida, this, North Carolina, South Carolina, this is a real major problem. So, so it really helps a lot with our crops. Anything we can do to keep plant parts off the ground, trellis crops, that really can help a lot. It helps reduce soil compaction. The other thing, it's sort of an unseen benefit. When a grower asks me, he said, hey, what do I do for cultivation for my crop? You know, a lot of times growers get a little bit out of hand and they, they, don't, they don't cultivate, they plow. You, a lot of times for weeding, all you want to do is break up the soil surface. So what happens sometimes, what I see is you go out to a farm and all of a sudden there'll be a couple of rows of tomatoes and they're showing blossom end rot. And what, what has happened is they deep plow. They plowed and they root pruned. So they actually damaged the root structure. So and that's really bad. It can be really bad on, on bare ground if you're not careful. So this is just, you know, having the plastic because a lot of the roots tend to be concentrated under that plastic. So you tend to avoid issues like root pruning if you're not, if you're not careful. And of course, double cropping. And I'll show you some pictures of what that looks like here. Uh, when you, uh, with rotation, you have to keep in mind just basic useful horticultural practices. We have to consider uh, uh, rotation. We try not to follow a cucurbit by a cucurbit by a cucurbit. We certainly do it sometimes in our plants, but obviously that's not been, that's not a good idea in the long term. So, so when we think about double cropping, we're looking at like saying doing spring strawberries. String strawberries are done. Uh, you can go out and you can plant snap beans on your plastic. So it's, it's in a whole different family. You can look at putting squash out there or something else. But what you want, whatever double crop you do use, obviously you're hoping to have a market for that crop. I think obviously that's the first thing. But second is just make sure it's not in the same plant family. So otherwise, you're just going to increase the disease incidence, especially of soil-borne um, problems that are endemic in that particular plant family. So rotation is important regardless. So and even a short rotation is beneficial. We always talk about year after year after year. Even a couple of months is helpful, you know, so in, in, the, in the long term. Uh, this is just a couple double crops. In the Panhandle of Florida, in the southern part of Alabama, we'll have a lot of early spring tomatoes that will go in. When they're done, when they're done with their final harvest, and, the case, and in the case of Florida is, they harvest the plants usually three or four times they're done with it. They'll spray it with Paraquat or another herbicide. Uh, they will kill it. And then, and we do it too in the southern part of Alabama, it's sort of a different combination of things, but we'll kill it and then we'll go through and then we'll, we'll, we will plant, um, uh, we'll let the plants die down, we'll leave the vines and the strings out there and we'll plant, we'll direct seed cucumbers. Seed, uh, trellis cucumbers have much higher yields than on ground. We tend to get a lot better shape, you know, we don't end up with crooks and bent ones and things like that, a lot less soil borne belly rots and things like that. So, but trellising itself is really expensive and sometimes crop wise, unless you've got a real premium for your crop, it usually doesn't make a lot of sense to trellis it. So here's an example of a double crop. You've already spent the money on the, on the tomatoes, you've got them out there, and they will trellis up on there. It's a really nice double crop to do. So um, that's one. And this is strawberries. Uh, they went through, they cleaned out all the strawberry plants, so they went through and they put some, uh, there's some lettuces and other mixed greens that are out in this, in this field. So, so um, and it takes advantage of the fact that strawberries have very close spacings that we use typically. So you try to match the spacing a little bit because the more holes you put in the plastic, the more compromised it is, the more weed problems you could have. So what you try to do is actually replant within those holes. They do make sweepers. They actually go behind a, a they'll go behind a, they'll hook to a three point uh, hitch on your tractor. And it's just, it's just a big broom, a spiral broom. They'll go through and actually clean it off. You still have to go through and pull some of the pieces off, but they actually do a pretty nice job. But the key to that is you also have to make sure you use good quality plastic, otherwise the plastic will tear and tear terribly. And then once that happens, you might as well just pull it off and start over again. How thick is that plastic? Is it like a four or seven? Actually, I'll show you. Uh, but the question was about, about the thickness of the plastic. Normally, for double cropping, you want to at least use something that's a mill and a quarter. That's at a minimum. So, and, and if you get much thicker than that, the problem is the price. It gets a little silly. So the price doesn't go up proportionally. It goes up exponentially once you start getting thicker. So the standard plastics that are out there are one and one to one to one to one point two five mil. So and, and either one of those really does work. It start if, if you try to use there's also eight tenths of a mil product out there, which is really single use. If you try to sweep it, it tears. So so but yeah, it, and honestly plastic quality has gotten better in the last twenty years. It used to be there were some manufacturers that were so so and they were just sort of getting into ag plastics. And they, didn't, they just didn't work well. They didn't have good stabilizers in there, and so they, they would photodegrade, and they'd break apart and get brittle. That's not been a problem really the last you know, 20 years. So, but anyway, 
but this is a way to spread your production costs off, off, you know, across two crops. And, it's, and you've got a very long growing season here, and that's the kind of thing that works real well. Uh, you can use combinations of low tunnels and caterpillar tunnels. I've seen people put high tunnels, you know, where they, you know, port, uh, uh, high tunnels they can easily pick up and move. They're sort of smaller than the 96-foot ones. You know, so there's a lot of combinations of things you can do. And you don't have to just put one crop out here. You can put multiple crops out there. So, And a lot of times, like in the case of the, the tomatoes, there's usually enough fertilizer left in those beds after that crop that in the case of the cucumbers, they usually don't have to put anything out there except water. You know, there's ample, there's ample fertilizers. But one thing that's important to do, just as a preventative to make sure things are okay, is get a soil test done. So you should always soil test before each crop. So in, in this case, you really should soil test before you put in whatever the double crop's gonna be, just so you know what's going on and you don't need to add anything special. Uh, never let the beds dry between double crops. In Alabama, we have very heavy clay soils. Here you've got some loamy soils. And some of the soils, when they get dry, it's like wetting a brick. So if you let those soils dry between crops, it can be really, really hard to wet them. Now, it may, seem, it may sound counterintuitive to wet the bed when there's no crop out there, but the problem is, is trying to re-wet that bed. You're going to spend a lot of effort and energy to try to do that. So it's helpful to try to maintain some soil moisture out there, even between the double crops, just so you don't dry that bed out completely. So, All right. There's problems, obviously, and I'll show you some of the economics in a minute. But... I think the biggest thing that you need to realize is there is no universal design to use this correctly. A lot of times growers tend to be limited to what's available locally to them. So, and I'm not saying, and I'm not poking fun at a store or, make, or anything like that or a supplier, but the problem is, is a lot of times, like in Alabama, I'll go into a local uh, store and they'll have one type of drip tape. They have, you know, one type of everything, and that may not be suitable for all the situations. So, there are a lot of good places and manufacturers you can order this stuff online buy the stuff in bulk, it's a whole lot cheaper going with several growers. So that's really the best way to sort of, you know, get the best for your money and to really get what you need for your specific situation. And sometimes it may not be suited to all situations. With contour, we have in Alabama, we still have a lot of, uh, uh, we have a lot of, uh, of, uh, of uh, sorry, my mind just went, we have a lot of terraces. We have a lot of terraces in Alabama, they're old cotton land, all right? And some of those terraces, because of the way they're designed, the topography, they are just not a good candidate for plastic culture because it's, it's hard to lay plastic on an, you know, in an arc. You can do it a little bit. It would much prefer to be in a nice straight line, you know, so, but it, it can't really make significant twists and turns. So that's the problem with sometimes with these terraces. So not every situation is suited for it. It may just be a case where I should just use drip and use an organic mulch. You know, we have a lot, I see people use everything from, in Alabama, we use a lot of pine straw as a mulch around ornamentals. It's actually a really good mulch around plants and it's fairly cheap. So I will say one thing I have seen in the past is a lot of the people who grow pine trees, like in Alabama now, uh, they will treat for weeds in, in and around their pine forests. And the problem is some of those herbicides are very persistent. They'll last 12 to 18 months. So I've seen people take pine straw, put it in their garden, damage your tomatoes because of residual activity from the herbicide that's in the pine straw. So, and you can have the same thing with almost anybody who, has a, uh, who raises horses or has a pasture. Chances are they use a herbicide on the pasture and that herbicide will carry you over to your, to your uh, garden if you're not, or if you have a lawn surface that comes in or you use some kind of herbicide, that kind of stuff from grass clippings can, uh, will maintain even if it's composted. So it's, it's one of those things that simply takes time for it to degrade. So anyway, no universal design. There's experts out there. Uh, there's several companies that I work with, and the nice thing is most of them will work with small growers. They don't care if you've got a couple acres. Obviously, they're hoping to sell you product, but uh, there are certified drip irrigation engineers out there that work for many of the drip irrigation companies that work with vegetable growers. You can get them. You can pick their brains. Some univers all, Unfortunately, most a lot of universities in the southeast don't have egg engineers anymore that work in this area. Um, there's one, or, one in Florida, and I don't think there's anybody else in the southeast right now. So that used to be a, they used to be excellent sources of info. So now we sort of have to go to private companies a lot of times. But most of those companies will help you do a design. They'll say, all right, here's the... Here's my land, here's the contour, here's my water source, what do I need to do, here are the crops I'm going to grow. You know, so you can usually get a lot of information from groups like that. So, you know, some charge, some don't, some just want you to buy their product, you know, if they give you the design. So, so there is, so certainly is help available out there. Um, you have to think about the cost versus the yield. Um, 
again, you may have a crop that's really marginal when it comes to spending that extra money per acre to put out that drip tape and the black plastic. And that's where the, you have to think about economics a little bit more, and I'll, I'll sort of mention that in a second. So, and there's also a disposal cost. Uh, in Alabama, most of our counties will take plastic, and they don't care if it's wrapped. You know, a lot of times when you pull up the plastic, it's got dirt, it has pesticide residue on it often. Uh, and in Alabama, they'll accept it in almost any of the landfills. However, if I'm in Florida, that's not the case. If I'm in some other states like New York or Pennsylvania, that's not the case. So there's some issues. I don't know if there's any problems in, you know, in Missouri with disposal. So Alabama, I can burn it. Obviously, that <laughs> may not be the best thing, but you can burn it. You know, we have a lot of, we have peach growers like now that, you know, to save their, uh, their crop from freezing, they'll burn tires and old plastic. That's so a lot of times they'll take it just so they have it on hand to burn it, you know, to keep the, to try to uh, keep their crop warm. Specialized equipment. I'm, I'm sorry, you have a question? Yeah, the comment was. Oh no, no. It's, and the comment was about the disposal of the plastic material. It's a problem, and it will differ sometimes by county that you're in and by state. Like I said, in Alabama, I can burn it. I don't think that's the best thing to do with it, but it can be because we have no recycling set up for it. Florida, and New York do. You know, they have pro, pro, you know they have facilities set up, but it will only take a margin, a minimal amount of it right now. That's the problem. And this plastic is re recyclable to some degree, and a lot of times this will go to like making park benches, you know, and other kinds of materials like that. It'll get mixed in. So it is, it is. But the, there's always the res residue of the pesticide on there, plus the dirt. That's sort of always an option. So, but I agree. Try to find a place to do get rid of this. You know, if you're going to use it or there are, there are biodegradable products out there that are available now that are actually really good. Very expensive, two or three times more than standard plastic, but you don't have to worry about pulling it up and you don't have to worry about throwing it away. Um, up until last year, there was actually one product that was labeled for organic production, but it's not on the market anymore. But apparently that company is trying to reformulate it to put it back on the market. So there'll be one available, hopefully, for um, organic growers. But yeah, disposal is an issue, I agree. Um, Anyway, obviously we've got specialized equipment. So there are plastic layers. There are a lot of companies that make these plastic layers, but they all have the same implements to them. They all have the same structure. They all have the same pieces. So normally you've got, um, this is one company from Rainflow. They sell a lot of products. Uh, you've got a spool up here that has the drip tape. So the drip tape and the plastic in the bed, all that is done in one pass. So it, it, these are usually called combo units or mulch layer combo units. So. So you've got the plastic layer. In this case, this is, this is a water tank, but it's for water. It's actually to hold the, bed, the press pan down. This is the press pan. The press pan is what sets up the bed. It actually pulls up the bed and firms it up. Um, the, the plastic here, these coulters, so and things, just to give you a better sort of a close up. So, but they all basically do the same thing. One thing that they all have in common is now, is you always want a better that does a crown. You want there to be a crown in the center of the bed. You don't want it to be flat. That crown, that little rise in the center of it, when it rains a lot of times, you don't, water's going to have a tendency to puddle on top of the plastic if it's not nice and tight. That crown helps the water roll off the plastic so it never sits on there. So, but when you look in a catalog, you'll see a crowning device. It'll have some other common, other terminology, but you always want to have a nice crown on the bed. Uh, uh, sometimes you have somebody laying on the back or riding on the back of this thing. Uh, sometimes not, but basically the person back there swaps when one roll, roll of plastic is done, he s throws in the other roll of plastic. Quite an art form to do that. Um, if you look on YouTube right now of the operation of these kind of equipment, you'll, you'll learn an awful lot just, you know, compared to me actually. I was going to show you a video, but you can go out and Google the videos and you can see how this is done. They do make, uh, there are some paper products. There's a product called Planters Paper Mar Mulch. And, uh, Excuse me, and I've actually put it out with a plastic layer, and actually, uh, the new version of it now actually works pretty well for a paper material. The biggest problem is the paper doesn't have a, it has, a, it doesn't have any stretch. So if you're not careful and the machine sort of gets caught up a little bit, you'll tear it. Where in this case, the plastic will stretch a little bit, and you have a little bit of give. But there are other options out there, or plastics or products that can be put down with these plastic layers. So, I think the max you can get is four feet. 
48 inches, yeah. Yeah, uh, 48 inches. So I haven't seen anything wider than that. So, uh, but, you know, but, and it's a little bit more expensive, but the nice thing is you don't have to worry about it. And what it is, it, it's basically a paper product that's coated with wax, with a waxy material to keep it, make it repellent to water. Oh, there we go. This is just another version of it. So uh, there are, but they all, like I said, they all do basically the same thing. And the other nice thing is the implements that I'm just showing you right now are for putting out multiple acres. You could buy rows or units to put out single rows you, and, or triple rows or quadruple rows, rows. So you don't see them very often except until you get into Florida and things like that. And obviously, the bigger it is, the bigger tractor you need to pull it. So Tractor-wise on this, you still need 80 or 90 horsepower to pull it. That's usually about the minimum. But they, most of the companies now make these, uh, what they call blue line or light lines or, or limited use plastic layers. And that's, this is one of them from Rainflow. So instead of spending uh, the seven grand for this or $7,500 for this, you can buy, oops, sorry. There we go, go back. Like I said, about the $7,500 to $8,000 for this you can buy this one. And this is designed for like, uh, we have strawberry growers in Alabama that most of them have less than an acre or maybe just one or two acres. And a lot of them buy this kind of equipment. This is designed just to do a few acres a year or a few acres a season. So in this implement, I think these are just under $4,000 now. So that's, you know, three or $4,000 less than the large mulch layers. So, you know, that's out there. And, then, and I think this also becomes more affordable for people too, quite frankly, so. But it does everything. It does not make the best bed. And, and I'll show you ways you can sort of get around that. So, but that's, that's sort of the trade-off. So this implement before makes a really tight bed, a really high bed, really tight bed, meaning it's nice and firm. So this one, it's so, oh, I'm sorry. This one, it's so-so. You may actually have to make multiple passes without the plastic layer on it um, to actually make a nice bed. So it just, it just takes a little bit more effort on your part. So because of the way the press pan is designed. Uh, this is homemade. Uh, it actually works great. So the guy, uh, if you're a good welder and you've got some toolbars sitting at home and some things to throw up on a three-point hitch, uh, he went, he took pictures at an expo of several different units and he came back and he did this. And it really does a nice job. It may have cost him 50 bucks, you know, to do this. So, but he's a welder. You know, so if you've got the skill, uh, like I said, the original plastic layers were built by farmers. You know, they said, hey, I think I can do the following, you know, and so that's where a lot of this stuff came from. So, so this is just another innovation. So, and I, it was clever. It worked well. So I'm not going to say it didn't work well. This worked really well on a flat. If you have a very flat area, something like this works really well for you. If it's hilly, this won't work well for you. you would, he had a little bit of in, sort of uh, contour changes in the soil, and that's where this thing really fell down. But you know, for the 50 or 60 bucks he invested in, and it was mostly time, it worked pretty nice, pretty well. Um, uh, there are plastic layers for small growers, even smaller growers, you know, they could be used in high tunnels. So we have, and if you go like into the Johnny's catalog or, um, sorry, there's a couple other companies that sell it, but this one's a mechanized version. And uh, it's actually a plastic layer, and it works okay. So, but this is also, this, this is a, an, uh, can't think of the name of these tractors. Um, say that. Yes, yes. Thank you. So, um, but they make. But the nice thing is they make all these different implements that go on the back of it. This just happens to be the plastic layer. So you could buy. You know, this can also have a rototiller on it and, and some other implements. So, so this will pull up a nice bed, especially on a very friable, loose, nice, nicely, you know, tilled soil. Uh, this one by hand. I've tried to do this by hand. And these two guys make it look easy, and it's not. Yeah. So, you know, you feel like you're dragging several things of concrete along. It's really not easy. So, because basically it's really easy when it starts. Then as you get, like, midway down the row, you're like, man, this is getting heavier and heavier. And you realize, you know, you got to really strain. But it works. And I think this, in this case, uh, we were just, uh, the one I was using was just, I think the plastic was simply too wide for what we were doing. We should, if we used narrow plastic, this probably would have been better. But this one is sold by Johnny's. Uh, so, and you can also find it in some other specialty catalogs out there. So, um, so you've got these small versions that you can use just on a small farm. So you don't have to necessarily buy, you know, the plastic layer they just showed you. Um, obviously, when you've got the plastic, you've got to get the plants out there somehow. And for plastic, 
we've almost always depended on simply using transplants. That's always been the mainstay. So, but we've got some implements now that actually work real well for direct seeding, and I'll, I'll show you to those in a second. But this is the typical transplanter, and these transplanters cost two to three thousand dollars, depending on what you're going to get. These are the water wheels. This is what makes the hole and puts a little bit of fertilizer solution in it. You almost have uh, two or three people on the back of it simply dropping tomatoes or transplants into a little hole that will go down and the machine sort of firms it around the soil. So, so uh, this is the tried and true way to do it. It can be done by hand. Obviously, it's a little bit more time consuming to do it. There we go. Um, this is just doing it by hand. This is a jab planter. This is just a note, you know, but honestly, when I do small plots like this, you know, or small areas, I use a long handle bulb setter. I'll go out with a tape measure. I'll mark where I want my plants, and I, then I will go through with a long handle bulb setter and just make the holes. So it's a little bit larger typically than I need, but it works really well. So uh, there are automated systems now. This one's from an Israeli company. This one's from a, I think they're from Uzbekistan. So, but this, is, this puts up the plastic and puts out the transplants and drip tape all in a single pass, and all you need is one or two people in the back of these things, and this is GPS driven, by the way, too. So all you need is a couple people in the back of it feeding transplants into the hopper. That's all they do. These things are probably, I'm sure this is a fifty or $60,000 piece of equipment, if not more. They're, I think the only one that's commercially available is this one. This one is under development, at least according to their website. This is the future of things at some point. I don't know that it'll be a long time. It'll be a long time before I see one of these in Alabama, I realize, and probably any place in the U.S., but it's interesting. You know, and it makes me, you know, and people are always coming up with innovations, so to make things a little bit easier. But GPS-driven is pretty nice. That's obviously the, uh, you know, the future for a lot of things. There we go. Uh, direct seeding has always been an issue on plastic, but we've got some really good implements out there now that work quite well. Like I say, we're almost always concerned about transplants, but in this case, um, there's a, these are brand names, all right? One is called a polyplanter, and it's actually from a farm over, it's in Pennsylvania called Furs Farms. If you Google on polyplanter, um, this is their mechanized version of it that does multiple rows. I'm going to show you one of the single row ones too. So uh, Drum Punch, this, it's another brand name basically. And what the Drum Punch does, it takes the, the basically, the, um, you've all probably seen the, uh, some of the more high-end cedars are all vacuum cedars. So it takes the vacuum part of the cedar and it sort of marries it with this punching device. So it's sort of clever. Dibble planters, this is, that's not a brand name, but it's a type. Um, but so we've got these that work pretty well. So they're, some of the older systems that were used were cumbersome, and they usually involved either flaming or melting the plastic to make the hole. But these are, these are combinations of precision seeders, so high, you know, high precision seeders that singulate seed correctly, put it at the depth you need. So, uh, but obviously, they're a bit on the pricey side. If I'm a small grower, I use this one myself for small plot work. So this is called a Poly Planter Junior. Again, I'm not getting a kickback from these folks, but it's one of the more clever unit, uh, units I found that I can direct seed large seeded crops onto plastic without a whole lot of problems. You can buy the whole kit from them with all these nipples on it. They open up. It actually, if you've ever seen a cotton planter, you know, or a seeder, that's sort of the, what this is based on. But all these nipples are removable, so you can actually change the spacing on this. You can buy the kit from the farm, and I think it's for everything, for all the different spacings and the spacers and the things that help you adjust seedling depth. I think it's about 500 bucks. Now, St. Man's saying like a lot of spending your money, but seeding equipment's expensive. And if you want something that's really precise, you've got to spend it. And, and honestly, this is a really nice entry into that kind of thing. Because some of the crops we work with, like arugula and lettuce, uh, the seed's horrible to try to direct transplant. That's why we usually use transplants, I'm sorry, to direct seed, that's why we usually use transplants, but this opens up an area, you know, that gives you some options to do things. Now, I will say this, with this, the Polyplanter Junior, I have not had a lot of success with small seeds. It works great on watermelons and um, corn. Basically, once I get down to cucumber seeds and smaller, it has issues. You know, it won't, it'll start double seeding or some other weird things will happen, so, uh, but I think that's just this is that there's actually a second generation out this out there now. The, the one I've got is is one of the old generation. So the first, the second generation ones are supposed to be better, but I haven't played with that one yet. So, but you know, for entry level into this, compared to if I were to get in a precision planter, a large scale one, I, I'm buying a mono sun planter. The vacuum assist part of it's ten thousand dollars just to start. So, 
it's expensive to, you know, to get in it. But it's nice because you're not handling transplants, because you know, there's always that labor associated with transplants. So, so this gives you some other options. When you're doing plastic, obviously, um, I've already mentioned, you need to have a firm bed. You do not want the bed to be able to collapse under your weight if you walk on it. So if you walk on it and collapses, that's not a firm bed. Now, I'm not saying compacted. I'm saying firm. So and if it's nice and firm and well-formed, what you find is it doesn't lose its shape. It's, it retains its shape. And you also that's also key to good water movement through the bed. The bird, it really needs to be very firm. I'll talk about more about that uh, this afternoon. Again, like uh, the gentleman mentioned before, you want to try to use quality plastic. And I, I like the mill and a quarter material better. It's just simply more forgivable. So you can use one mill. I don't know that you need much thicker than one and a quarter mil because of the expense, and I don't think you're getting a lot of benefit from it unless you're going to use it for multiple seasons. But like in Alabama, uh, we have deer, we have wildlife that will just walk across the field and puncture holes in your plastic. So I'm not sure how much make sense it makes to use a really expensive plastic in those situations where we're going to have to probably within a year replace it. So, so um, when you're putting it out, you always want to make sure that you, uh, you seal the ends. I see a lot of times people will forget to do this in, in your area, in the springtime, it's windy here, you know, so wind will get under these rows and it'll lift the plastic up and pull it off. So, so this is just a, you know, just to tuck it around. And also, when you, the drip irrigation tape, you don't want to cut it right at the end of the bed. You always want to leave a pigtail. You want to leave 15, 18 inches extra. That's sort of like, that's extra room for you in case there's an issue. And, and I'll, I'll talk more about that with irrigation, but what you typically find is you have to flush the ends of the drip tape out periodically because soil and silt will accumulate in it. And so if you have this little pigtail at the end of it, that's where all the soil and silt will accumulate. It won't accumulate next to emitter next to the plant under the bed. So this is just sort of a cheap insurance thing. All right. This is a better. They make them in all different sizes and shape. So some are like this. Um, and it just makes a, a rough bed. Then you come through after this with the bedding unit. So a lot of times with those, those uh, low-end units that I showed you that are only designed for a couple acres, you use something like this just to pull up a temporary bed, and this will, when you run the bedder over it, you'll, you'll fill out the bed much more uniformly by doing this. So uh, this is a little bit more drastic. Uh, we see actually a lot of these in Alabama, this type like this, so it's pretty heavy. So, but they work great, and it almost looks like your, your finished product. Then usually right after this, the person with the plastic is going to follow that. So, so on a sandy soil, that's definitely the way to go, and, and you're going to form a much tighter bed with that. You could do the same thing with disc killers. Oh, oh that's the next one. Um, this is what it looks like when you don't fill out the bed well. Remember I said the problem, you know, if you don't have a nice crown on the top of the bed, water's going to settle on these plants. And the wind is also going to force that plastic to move up and down and actually damage the sides of the plants. I'll show you a picture of what that looks like. So, but what you're seeing on here is abrasion. It's damaged simply from the, pla the plastic flopping up and down. You never want to see this. The beds need to be fully filled out. And that's where those pre-bedders come, you know, come in handy you know, on your soil situation. Every spice soil situation is a little different. Everyone's management is different. You can use the bedder with no plastic and no drip tape on it just to form a pre-bed. Or you could spend the money and do something, oops, there, uh, you can do something like this. You can also, come on, there we go. This is what the damage typically looks like when the plastic, this is, you can get damage on plastic in two ways, um, either from phys physical abrasion, so you never want to put the plast plant right on the plastic, the edge of the plastic, just simply because that plastic is going to move a little bit and you can actually damage, you know, just cause an abrasion on the side of the plant. The other thing is if you plant a transplant that might be hardened off and ready to go on into black plastic in the summer in Alabama, you'll cook it. And that's actually what you're seeing here is more damage, just simply you've cooked the stems. So, you, you know, so that's why we switch to black or white plastic in the summertime typically, so just to prevent transplant shock like this. Uh, just doesn't want to advance. Come on. Thank you. All right. Can you go back? All right, now go forward. I thought there was another slide in between that, but yeah. Thanks. All right. Um, with plastics, there's two types of plastics tip that we talk about. They're smooth and embossed. Embossed plastic almost looks like a diamond pattern when you look at it. And what you want is the embossed product. The embossed product will stretch, and it's got good memory, and it will hug the bed. You know, whereas the smooth plastic, 
it'll stretch a little bit, it'll rebound a little bit, but it doesn't hug the bed quite as tightly as the embossed uh, does. So, so really, for especially if I'm a novice and I've never laid plastic before, I think the embossed product is a lot better. It's a lot more forgiving. So it might be a little bit more expensive, but it's 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 really not that big of a deal. But I think in terms of putting it out, it's a whole better option. You could find every color under the rainbow of plastic. So and but really, what it comes down to right now, all the research has been done. I've done research on every color you can possibly imagine. But right now in Alabama, it's either uh, black in the springtime to warm up the soil. Then when it gets warm, like it's going to over the next week or two, uh, we'll switch on use we'll use white on black. So it's not completely white. If you were to use just a white material itself, white plastic, the problem with that is it's translucent. So sunlight will still penetrate through that, so you'll actually cause weed seed to germinate. So that's why you've got this white on black, and it's, it's called co-extruded. There's actually a 0.75 millimeter white piece of plastic on top of a 0.7 millimeter thick black piece. piece. It's really cool the way it's done. So, and it's basically held together with static electric. It's really cool. So with the machinery that does it, so uh, it's pretty fascinating. The, uh, this is some of the plastic. Uh, IRT Red has been pretty popular. If I'm in Pennsylvania and I'm a tomato grower, I get benefit from it. If I'm a tomato grower in Alabama, I don't. I've done, used it enough in many years that I've, I simply see no yield response for it. So, so there seems to be some you know, regionalization in terms of some of the benefits from this. So um, some growers, um, I grew up in New Jersey, whoops, and we'll have some growers that will use um, a blue plastic or yellow. So, and they just absolutely swear by the stuff. Uh, let's see, what else was there? I think, um, anyway, so this is the different colors. But like I said, it still comes down to really the, the um, black or ultimately the white on black. There are other special products like this, the silverized plastic or the silver on black. Uh, this is for insect management. So a lot of the insects, it sort of basically screws up with their ability to, to figure up from down. So you can actually delay uh, thrip landing on your plants when the plants are small. So they use these reflective mulches like this. The black is to cool the soil surface and heat, you know, a little bit, or I'm sorry, to heat it up a little bit. The plants will go in there, then you've got, this is actually aluminized plastic. This is actual aluminum that's in the plastic material itself. This is a solid aluminum plastic, um, which is really cool to see it from a distance because it almost, when it's in a really large field, it almost looks like a lake and it's really highly reflective. Um, most of the products you're gonna find though are, are like this. Um, basically, it's not aluminized, but it's somewhat reflective. So it's, it's sort of a, almost looks like a dark gray as you're, you're seeing there. But really what, what you find is um, you definitely get a, yield, I mean, a benefit from using these early on. Once the plants get too large like this, they're covering, up, they're covering up the reflective surface so and you're not getting any more benefit from it. But the benefit is really when the plants are small. And what we find is for insects like aphids and thrips, if we can delay the feeding of those things early in the season, the plants have a much better start and they're usually able to resist some of the problems once they get large enough. Uh, this is a specialized use of clear plastic. This is actually in Pennsylvania. So what they do is they use this clear plastic, which you almost never use for any kind of thing because it gets so hot. You know, the, the basically it's going to be 10 to 12 degrees over ambient under that plastic, if not hotter. So it's a real, if, um, if you ever read about soil, uh, solarization, which is a great trick of an organic grower to, to try to sterilize my soil, um, so it gets hot. So what they'll do is they do these really high, these tight beds. Um, the, the plants will be anywhere from six to 12 inches apart, normally six inches. The, the corn will only get up to maybe my chest high. They'll get one nice ear. But if I'm a grower in Pennsylvania or New Jersey, I'm getting a dollar an ear for early corn. So it pays for itself. You know, we're here, I don't know. You know, it's the kind of thing you may have to explore your marks a little bit, but they actually, this machine actually does the seeding and puts the plastic down at the same time. So it's actually from that, I mentioned before, drum punch, they, they're the ones who make this thing. So, um, but it, it, but if, you ever, if you're ever interested in something like this, I'm happy to talk to you about it, because uh, it's, it's a whole lecture just by itself. Uh, there are other types of plastics out there, but really what it comes down to is um, special needs. Um, IRT plastics are increased soil, but remember we have, I showed you that IRT red I just haven't seen any benefit from it, so, but there are other types of IRT plastics, but they're basically designed to elevate soil temperature a little bit more than some of these standard plastics. 
uh, VIF and TIF are used. These are for fumigation. They're designed to actually trap fumigant more effectively in the bed so you get a better, you can use lower rates of fumigant and you get better kills basically for whatever organism you're trying to work on. So they're very expensive, but they work. Um, if I'm a grower in Georgia, Southwest Georgia has a large industry, they all fumigate. And that's what you're seeing. These are actually, this is a virtually uh, VIF film with a three-way combination of fumigants used underneath of it to control nut sedge. Um, this is what it looks like when you use half the rate. This is what it looks like when you don't use any herbicide. Their nut sedge problem is so bad in that, in that part of the state, they, they have to go through a lot of, a lot more work typically than a lot of our, the other states have to do because of the problem. So, but there's uses for it, so, but I won't, I won't talk too much about that. Uh, above ground or below ground? We're going to talk more about that. You know, where is my water source coming from? Because that's going to make some, make some decisions for you in terms of how complex your irrigation system is going to be. Um, when it comes to drip tape, I mean, you know, we're going to talk more in my ne the next talks uh, on drip tape and scheduling irrigation, uh, placement of drip tape, where you put it at with, within the rows, um, and also a little bit more about fertigation. When it comes up sort of in, in summer, you know, when it comes up to things, you know, uh, one of the more common things I've seen growers do who've never used drip tape before is they'll unroll the tape in the wrong way. There's actually an upside and a downside to the tape. If you look on the side of the tape, there's an arrow showing you the, the, rot the way you're supposed to rotate it. A lot, see, the problem is there are holes in it. And a lot of people have the assumption is, oh, the hole should be at the bottom. And it's just the opposite of that. The hole should be up. So when you unroll a thing of drip tape, make sure that the holes, the emitter size, are always up. And like I said, on the side of the tape, there's usually a mark on there saying that. So the reason behind that is, so a lot of times when, when you turn your drip irrigation system off, you've got water going through there at a, at a fairly high velocity. You know, so low pressure, high velocity. When you turn it off, a vacuum will form. Water will actually get sucked back through the system, and that's going to have a tendency to pull materials in around the emitter. So if there's sand or silt and things like that around the emitters, it's going to have a tendency to pull it in. If the drip tape is upside down, you're more likely to pull in materials. You just decrease those odds by putting it the other way. I know it sounds sort of simple, but that's, that's why. There is a reason for it. So, Obviously, taking out the tape is the other issue, and I think what the gentleman said about disposal is key. You know, before you do this, figure out what you're going to do with it, and honestly, to see, even see if it makes sense in your situation. So we have a lot of very small operations that use this, and they found it really helps with their labor management. It really helps because it helps with weed control. You know, any kind of mulch is going to help with weed control, organic or otherwise, or, or this. This is an undercutter. Basically, this is a, basically all this thing is is a potato digger that they've sort of modified to undercut the plastic and lift it a little bit. So if you happen to have an old potato digger sitting around, you can actually adjust it for this. These things cost a couple hundred bucks. You can, I, they always sell them used. You can almost always find these things on eBay or for equipment for sale. Um, this is just another version of the same thing. And also they can make winders where it'll actually go through and it'll spool the stuff on a big roll. roll. Otherwise, what you find is, you know, you and somebody else is walking down the row and pulling the plastic, so like that, and shaking it off, trying to get the plastic off, and then you sort of bundle up and try to figure out what to do with it. So, but this machine makes the spools, makes spools out of it, so which is really nice and shakes some of the dirt off. But obviously, there's always an expense associated with, with all these things. Now, if you look at the expenses typically associated with this, um, with mulches, depending on the mulch and depending on your row spacing, you're usually going to spend someplace between 250 to 350 dollars just for plastic mulch for an acre, on a one acre basis, depending on the product and the spacing. Uh, for drip irrigation, it's going to be someplace between three to $350 an acre, and that includes most of the materials that you need, not just the drip tape, but also all the little parts and pieces that you need, and I'll show you uh, that stuff later on this afternoon. So, you know, so combined, you're going to be spending another $600, $700 an acre, but it should be well offset by the potential of that double or triple the yields that you would normally have got. That's the, you know, that's, that's the, the thing that, that obviously attracts growers to using this technology. So, so you've got to know your situation. You have to know your costs. Does it increase the yield? Does your increase in yield and quality justify the expense that you're adjusting? And like I said, for some crops, for tomatoes, bell peppers, I would say almost emphatically it's probably going to do that, So especially if I'm retailing it. Where are some other crops? Um, some of the leafy greens and things like that. So you've got, this is cabbage uh, on plastic. So uh, organic, or actually organic cabbage. So actually a newer grower in Alabama. So, but he realized that the, his break-even point 
since he, even though he was, he's wholesaling, so he's getting enough benefit from using that plastic just simply from the weed control effort in organics because it's so challenging. Um, it, it makes up for that difference for him. So, so you have to really look at each of your particular situations, see if it makes sense. You may find that you do a portion of your acreage on plastic and some of it not. So too, so and that's, that's okay. Everything doesn't have to go on plastic. So, but again, you know, you just sort of have to understand your situation. Oops. That was my last slide, but any other, any questions or comments? Yes, sir. How does it work with sweet potatoes? I've actually done it, and it's terrible. So, <laughs> so, so, however, uh, I, I will, and reason, it's just, they don't like the heat. So, honestly, and that's, that's, uh, we did it just as, with actually a uh, disposable plastic, a biodegradable plastic that was supposed to, you know, basically we looked at stuff. That, the, the question was, how do you use, how does the plastic work with a crop like sweet potatoes? So and we did, actually did a little research in, in Alabama with it, and we were using a biodegradable product. It was a 30-day, 45, and 90-day. So we thought maybe this would work out okay, but our conventionally produced sweet potatoes always outproduced it. And we measured soil temperatures, and we think it was just really a, it was more of an effect of soil temperature so, than anything. But anything else is pretty much fair game. Yes? Yeah, you, it's, and I, I was going to bring that up later when I talk a little more about the put it, installing and stuff, but he's right. Um, you know, it's, if, you want to, if you want to see something funny, it's you know, not putting enough pressure on there and then seeing that drip tape just disappear and fly down that line, and then you trying to find it. So then you realize that I just need to start my row over again. So, yeah, normally when you employ, put this stuff out, you're going to have a person on either, either row, either end of the row. You have a person in the tractor, and there's usually somebody riding the tractor, like, you know, on the on the, on the, the uh, bedding unit, but the person at the one end of the row is going to stand on the plastic and usually hold the drip tape while the tractor starts off. Then once the tractor gets going down the row, the pressure comes off that and you can let it go. That's when you want to seal up the end so you have it nice and sealed. Then gets the other end, the guy cuts it, leaves that little pigtail of plastic out there, and then you turn around and you start doing the other side. So, but yeah, that's a good, that's, that's so true. I've seen people try to do, do it with weights and cinder blocks Honestly, it just helps to have hands. So at that point, so because if you have to get what what you want, to, you can do this stuff really quickly. But most of the times, if I'm running the tractor, I don't want to have to get off the tractor, anchor the plastic and the drip tape, get back on the tractor. That just takes too long. So you just need hands. So if you have a big family, you know, so that helps. Or if you got some friendly neighbors. So any other questions or comments? Mm -hmm. And on the sweet potato, I agree with you, the stuff that is a lot harder, the black stuff is even worse. But I have noticed in Canada they use black stuff. Yeah. Uh, in the middle, like here, I've used white. Yeah. So, so the, I have to see it. Yeah, we had, we had some interesting problems with it. So, but again, I... I like the idea of it, so, but uh, that's interesting about Canada. So with, the, with bed height, basically, the question was about bed height and about other things about the sweet potatoes, but in terms of bed height, higher the bed is better, but what you're going to find is you're going to hit a maximum height depending on your soil type. That's, you know, the sandier the soil is, the easier it is to have an eight-inch high bed. The heavier the soil, the more clay the soil is, it's going to be half that a lot of times. So sometimes it depends on the tractor you've got pulling it, you know, how well you can get it. The loamy soils tend to be someplace in between that. So, but higher is always better when you can have it, but it's not always possible depending on the situation. So with the sweet potatoes though, I like the weed control aspect of it. And with the biodegradable stuff, actually, I like the idea of it, but it's just when we did the couple years of the run of the study, they just didn't, the, the stuff that was grown on bare ground still outdid it. It was really interesting, so. But one thing we have found is uh, we actually have a system where we use uh, the raised beds like we used in, uh, we have a, we designed a uh, roller crimper that works on um, uh, uneven terraces. So what we were doing is we would cover crop our, we're doing a lot of work with cover crops on sweet potatoes. So we'll, we'll put the cover crop up on those raised beds that are out there, put the sweet potatoes out there, but we've got this roller crimper that will work on those raised beds. It's really pretty cool. So instead of a flat bed kind of things, which is, we, we always want to have a nice high bed with sweet potatoes, so. 
It might work on, uh, has anybody tried to grow it on plastic here? On okay, in Virginia, so onions do great. So if you want to grow onions on plastic, we do a lot of sweet onions, the short day onions on plastic, real high density, and we'll get, you know, we'll be harvesting a month before Vidalia does in Georgia, so. Does it really? On black or white? That's impressive, so. Yeah, I, I just haven't had luck with it, but I'm not surprised. You know, I mean, honestly, it, where you're at in the country really makes a difference in terms of how you do these things, so, and how well. And that's like, like with the IRT red plastic, farmers in, in Pennsylvania and New York swear by it, and then when I do it, we get no change, and we did a lot of years of study with it, so I wish we had seen a change of it. You know, I've tried every color of the rainbow you could imagine, and it always comes back to black working well in the spring, white working well in the summertime, and then the, the silverized materials for insect management. So, but that doesn't mean it won't work well here for, you know, for other combinations. Anything else? Oh, I'm sorry. Her and then. I have a comment, though, if that's okay. Sure. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So um, that's just an example of where, as someone who's really small like us or doesn't have this equipment or is not using pillows to still use it, use the plastic technology to get it back. I've got a, another picture I'll show in my talk later. It's, it's really cool that the guy came up. He, he, can, he basically takes his plastic and he cuts it in half. He uses a table saw and he'll cut it in sections. And he developed this li little tiny planter a little, that he can push it and make a little tiny raised bed it'll be about six inches across so I mean it's really really cool I mean you know and he pushes it so uh, just it looks like a big wheeled uh, cultivator typically you used to see you know grandma and grandpa used to use or people use them as flower planters in their yards now so uh, but it, you know the nice thing with the plastic is like like she's saying is it's adaptable you can do a lot of things with it so it's not the most forgiving material sometimes, and it's, it can be a real pain to use it, but the benefit can really be impressive. So that's, that's interesting. So thanks. You, you had a question, sir? Uh, have you seen any reduction in disease in your plastic? No. And, and actually, uh, the question was, do you see any differences in diseases? Um, and actually, we had a pathologist on our, and we were working mostly with tomatoes and then the sweet potato study, but with tomatoes and some of the other crops, we didn't really see any differences. So we do see a difference with and without plastic, you know, so especially on uh, early blight, tended to be worse with no plastic, just probably from the soil being pushed up on the bottoms of the plants. So, so any, anything we could do to keep those plants, and that works with just a standard mulch, organic mulch too. Anything you could do to just prevent soil splashing onto the plants seems to help, so at least in Alabama. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and honestly, soil health and tilth is a whole other issue. So I've, it's one of those things you could spend the, another career on kind of thing. So, No, and, and honestly, even, the, you know, the question is about, you know, just changes in soil health with plastic. What I would, I, I'm sort of fascinating, some of this research I've seen coming out, there's some really cool stuff in Florida with mulching and fumigation. What they've actually found was, you know, normally the assumption is, uh, when you put a fumigant out, we sterilize the soil. And that's not true. What they've actually found was they've actually found increases in beneficial critters in the soil from fumigation. And actually, 
killing off things, around, you know, the negative things, some of the things that were plant diseases in the soil. So, you know, before most people said, oh, you're killing everything off, and that's not true. So there are people doing that, but it's very detailed work, and, and I, I suspect with the interest in organic agriculture, you're going to see more of it. All right, I suspect you're probably hungry at this point. So it's lunchtime, and I've spoken enough. So thank you.